I've paid thousands of dollars in courses to learn what you're basically teaching on your podcast for free. What you're putting out there is so valuable. So, you know, I just really want to acknowledge you and I definitely send everyone to your podcast. You were virtually one of the first mentors that I looked up to and started following. You're always one step ahead of the game, so I just wanted to give you kudos and props for that because lots of people are watching, lots of people are learning from it. Tucker and the whole TTM crew, Dan and Chris, thanks so much for your support. I love what you guys do and a huge, huge fan. Having this support's huge, so I'm grateful for that. What's up, everybody out there in the listener land? This is episode 284 of the Real Deals Podcast. And as always, I am your host, Tucker Merrihue. I want to thank you guys for joining me for what will be another awesome episode. Hey, last week, we kicked off this series called The Rock Stars of Real Estate. And what we're doing is we're basically taking the best content from all of the interviews that I've done over the years and we're bringing it back to the forefront and we're putting it, uh, kind of splicing it together and uh, we're making it uh, kind of some cool episodes out of it. So this week, we are gonna continue our Rockstars of Real Estate series, but I wanted to kind of transition a little bit to kind of the mindset side of things. Uh, And I've had a lot of guests on the show that really kind of can help you get your mind right, we'll call it, right? Get your mind right. Uh, But the three guests that we're going to have on this week's show are phenomenal in terms of just, number one, getting you pumped up, right? That's a a big thing, Uh, getting you motivated, getting you pumped up. But number two is their messages really seem to resonate with you guys uh, when we did the original show. So this week's show is uh, a culmination or a compilation of uh, Matty A, which uh, is, he was on the show a while ago. Many of you guys probably know who he is. Uh, He's got a lot going on down in the uh, Northern California area. I think Sacramento's Northern California. Anyway, Sacramento area, and he's got a bunch of stuff going on outside of that as well. Uh, but he's also got a big personal brand, so I'm sure many of you uh, know who Matty A is. Uh, and then Thatch, my man Thatch from up in the Seattle area. If you're in Seattle or anywhere in the Northwest, you know who Thatch is. Um, he's got a lot of really cool stuff going on, him and his whole organization, a bunch of great people up there. And then Quentin Flores, who uh, was on the show, I don't know, a couple of months ago. And uh, he's got a big operation going out of uh, down in Texas. And so a lot of these interviews were very kind of, um, you know, it was about the mental side of real estate uh, or just business in general, uh, which is, you know, a big part of it uh, at a a certain point. I mean, I was doing uh, some coaching calls yesterday and a lot of the calls were just focused on just the mental side, right? I mean, you know, real estate in theory is pretty simple, right? Now there's some challenges along the way, but our business is pretty simple uh, in terms of the sticks and bricks and just kind of the cause and effect, right? You market, people call, you talk to them, you try and buy something at a reasonable price. Uh, You either flip it to somebody else, take a small profit, or you take it, renovate it, put it to market and find an end buyer yourself, right? The, The concept is pretty simple, but it's the gray area, it's everything in between that makes it very difficult at times. And then of course, you know, just going through the daily grind, of, of anything, but um, you know the daily grind of real estate investing, it can really kind of wear on your mind a little bit. And so you have to kind of train your mind just like you train your body. And so I feel like these uh, interviews were kind of a great listen uh, in order to kind of get your mind right. And so we're going to bring them back and uh, kind of stream them or string them all together this week. And I think you guys are going to dig it. Now, beyond that, we've got a whole lot going on, uh, you know, with myself and TTM this week. We got a lot of projects. We got a new one kicking off. You know, a lot of talk out there right now, I've noticed, about uh, the market kind of, um, I guess, the looming recession, we'll call it. Really interesting time um, because there's a lot of people that are like, oh, I'm prepped for it. I'm ready for it. I'm going to make all these millions of dollars next time, The you know, when the market takes a dump or whatever. I find it funny because I was actually commenting on this today uh, in our Deal Finders Academy group. But, um, you know, there's a lot of people out there that are, quote unquote, poised to take advantage of the next, uh, you know, dip in the market that were nowhere near the real estate business uh, during the last go around. So I don't know. It's a it's a funny time. There's a lot of people that um, have become figureheads in this business that have become, you know, talking heads that have become gurus um, that are literally been in the business for three years. And, you know, it's not a knock on them. I'm happy for anybody's success. So don't take this the wrong way. But 
this business will make a student out of all of us at some point. And so to think that you've got it all figured out, you know, even me now, uh, I, I definitely do not. I mean, there's so many uh, parts of real estate that I still have a ton to learn and I've been doing this thing for 15 years um, So it's it's interesting. We've got an interesting time right now There seems to be definitely a glut of folks that are in the the wholesale side that are trying to build out these big wholesale operations um, Versus, you know, maybe just learning to find deals and then kind of climbing the real estate ladder with that skill set I don't know why exactly that's the case, but it's been interesting to see this kind of growth of our business in general and just kind of what it's turned into. I mean, if you'd asked me five years ago, if there'd be like this huge growth in like massive wholesale shops that want to be doing, you know, multiple markets and, you know, 50 deals a month uh, and have all this support staff and all these cold callers and all this crazy stuff, I would have never thought that that was the case. So it's, it's interesting to see how this business has kind of taken a turn and that's where it's had its most growth. Now, for us personally, you know, that's not a business that we ever wanted to build. Uh, we wanted to take that core skill set, which is finding deals, uh, and then we wanted to apply that to our own sticks and bricks business, which is then to take stuff, redevelop it, take it, renovate it, and then bring it to market um, at the, as the best possible product we can and retail it. And that's kind of our thing. And whether or not that's, you know, a... $400,000 renovation project or whether that's a three and a half million dollar new construction project or whether that's a multifamily project that we're renovating or ground up uh, or townhomes that we're building whatever it is right the core skill set is all the same which is finding the deal so I personally would have thought there'd be more people that have kind of grown into using the skill set of finding deals to then kind of fill the different buckets of, of projects that they're looking for but instead it seems like there's just uh, been you know a big influx of kind of uh, people that are aspiring to be high volume wholesalers so anyway interesting to see I will tell you this having been on both sides of you know the rainbow here in terms of both you know generating a large amount of earned income and then also having a, a fair amount of passive income as well you know everybody gets to the point of wanting to own more real estate eventually because then you don't pay any taxes right or you pay very limited taxes so this glorification of all the earned income that you can possibly earn without keeping uh, any properties for yourself or climbing the real estate ladder and doing some stuff where you keep it so that you can offset that income and depreciation it just seems kind of crazy to me um, you know at the end of the day but you know there's a lot of growth that a lot of these people have to have so again not a knock on anybody by any means it's just it's been a it's been an interesting ride we'll say and uh, I don't know where it's gonna go from here exactly but um, you know I'll be watching, as I'm sure all of you guys will as well. But without further ado, I want to get into this week's show, which is going to be a great show. I've got three fantastic guests. Uh, again, that's Matty A, that's Thatch, and that's Quentin. And they've got a lot of really good wisdom to impart on you and uh, just a lot of motivation. So let's get into this week's show, and I hope you all enjoy it. All right, Real Deals Podcast listeners, I want to talk quickly about our show's sponsor, Iron Bridge Lending. If you guys have not reached out to Iron Bridge already to talk to them about funding some of your upcoming flip projects, I highly encourage you to do so. I've known the owner of Iron Bridge for a very long time. I've personally borrowed millions of dollars from them over the years to do a number of different projects, and I can say without a doubt, they are the best hard money lending company I have ever come across, and that is the reason why they are the sole sponsor of this show. I've had a lot of other companies reach out to me and want to sponsor this show, but I just won't do it. I feel like I need to be genuine in who we have sponsoring the show, and it needs to be somebody that I've personally done a ton of business with. So I personally vouch for their ability to be the best, hands down, in the world of hard money lending. You won't find better programs, you won't find better terms, and they're lending or will be lending in over 20 states. So chances are, if you're hearing this in whatever state you're in, it's definitely worth it to check out their website, reach out to them, see if they're lending in your state, and if they are, I would absolutely encourage you to do business with them. Them. Another very cool thing to note is that they have a program for most rehabs where you can actually borrow up to 90% of the purchase price. Now, this is given the fact that you are actually buying a deal, which if you're listening to the show, that means you probably are. But if you have an actual deal on the table, they'll fund up to 90% of your purchase price and they'll even give you rehab funds on top of that, which means that it only takes 10% down to get into a project, which is unbelievable in the hard money world. So, do yourself a favor, reach out to Iron Bridge Lending, have a conversation with them, see if they're a good fit for you and for your next project. I can guarantee you that you'll be happy that you did. So let's dive into the real estate investing business first, right? Because that's obviously 
you know, mainly what this podcast is about and what I like to talk about. But of course, you've got a lot of other interesting stuff I want to dive into as well. But what does that business look like right now for you? And how how do you manage it, given all the other, you know, plates that you've got in the air? Yeah, for me, you know, and I'm still, I'll be the first to say, I'm still in a season of grind. I mean, I'm still happily working 80, 90 hours a week, but on my own schedule now, right? So, you know, I have a pretty dialed in routine because number one, first and foremost, is I don't want to be financially abundant and bankrupt in my health, bankrupt in my relationships with my wife or bankrupt with my daughter, being a horrible leader, a horrible family member, community member, you know, so for me, first and foremost, the whole goal of why I do what I do and how I've recreated my life through many of those failures of one of those areas becoming bankrupt is to live a whole life millionaire type concept of like being a level 10 in all of the gardens of life that are important to me. And I prioritize and schedule accordingly. So number one, first and foremost, is my daughter, my friends, you know, my family, my wife, all of the most important relationships get scheduled into my calendar first. Then obviously, of course, the business, making sure that, you know, I have people relying on me to, you know, continue to make revenue and generate opportunity for them to grow and scale. So I have a, a duty and a responsibility there. And then, you know, all of the other things get, you know, going down the priority pecking order, get scheduled in after that. So it's, you know, taking some massaging to figure all that out. But, you know, that's really how I'm able to do what I do is, is through truly being clear on what it is that my goals are and what I'm going after, because then I can actually say yes and or no to the, the right things or the wrong, you know, neglect the wrong things and get those out of my calendar. So scheduling is a big piece of it. Obviously, most important is people. You know, I've been fortunate enough to build up amazing teams that can support me because at the end of the day, I mean, you, me, you know, your listener right now, we are not scalable. You know, we all, we all have the same 24 hours in a day. We may use them differently, but at the end of the day, we aren't scalable. But if we get two people on doing the same efforts and same strategies and same activities that you and I are doing, well, then we can potentially 10x, 12x, 15x our, our time and our, our, you know, our results. So that's often where I've been able to cover a lot more ground, I think, in a short amount of time, being that I'm, you know, 29 now, I'm getting to that 30 year mark, man, I'm feeling like, hey, this is, uh, this is exciting, because this is I've been working my ass off to get to where I'm at today. And the goals that I am now looking at for the next 10 years, I would have never envisioned when I was first starting out as a real estate investor, but I can say, mentorship, masterminds, systems and people and just this, you know, grit to just keep, you know, this glutton for punishment of just keep coming back for more is some of the things that have really, really served me to get me where I'm at today. What would you say? Cause this has been my biggest challenge. You know, obviously you get to a certain point with your business, right? Where you bring people in, like you talked about and having people and leveraging them and having the right people specifically really enable you to 10 X, 12 X, 15 X your business, whatever it is. But what would you say is your ultimate responsibilities for your real estate investing business at this point? What are the things that you kept on your plate that help it moving forward and growing and driving? Because that's the thing that I'm always trying to figure out. What exactly do I need to keep on my plate? What do I need to shift out? So I'm curious what your take is on that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think that's the hardest part for for any real estate entrepreneur is to decide like where do we ultimately belong and oftentimes our identity in the beginning is we wear so many hats we are you know essentially a startup company right you're wearing your marketing hat your accounting hat your project management cap your negotiating cap whatever it may be and so oftentimes we get sucked into the vortex of owning a job and then when it comes time to potentially leverage ourselves out of it We've either built up ego or, you know, some calluses towards maybe wanting to hand off those things. So I've I've struggled with that in many different companies in many different capacities. And for me, I often just have to to retap back into why I got into the industry or the space in the first place. And for me, it was freedom. So if freedom is truly what I'm chasing, then I need to be honest with myself about where my highest and best use of my activities and time are and figure out what I can leverage and put systems in place and empower other people to do a whole lot, heck of a lot better than me, right? And so for me, I will say the one area that I'm still clear on the fact that I don't want to be sitting on a beach drinking, you know, a Mai Tai with an umbrella in it yet, like I am a deal junkie. I, I get excited about the day-to-day -day 
of the vortex that I'm in on a weekly basis. And for me, that's real estate investing and that's, you know, negotiating and analyzing deals. And it's the, the chase of the deal and it's everybody else that gets to participate in that. It's all the different companies. I'm a partner in a construction company. So they get a piece of that. You know, my real estate team gets a piece of that. Obviously, my investment company gets the majority of the, you know, the benefits of that. But there's a lot of other pieces and ancillary parts of this model that I'm still working out the kinks on. I'm still trying to figure out the best way to continue to build the ultimate empire that I have envisioned. That might be different for everybody else. So for me, I'm still in the day to day in regards to the analyzing of the deals, underwriting, structuring those deals and closing them. And then they get, you know, handed off to the next individuals who take ownership of those different roles. But for me, I know one of my greatest superpowers since day one has been, if I'm being honest with myself, is being able to connect with people and actually provide them with good options and help them determine what makes the most sense for them without steering them. And ultimately the result that comes out of one of those options tends to generate some kind of revenue for one of the companies. And, and for me, that's fun. That's exciting. It's part of one of the reasons why I got into this was not only just to make money, not only to be my own boss and have the freedom and flexibility to do what I want to do, but to also actually help people, you know, and, and really make a difference in people's lives who oftentimes, if their motivation is meeting my price, they're probably in a pretty damn difficult situation, right? So it, it's one of those things where I get a lot of joy and fulfillment out of that. And as I continue to put systems and infrastructure in place to ultimately leverage myself out when I choose to do that, I'm still in the game in, in that part of the bullpen. All right, guys, I want to take a minute here to talk with you about our Driving for Dollars app. Our Driving for Dollars app is in the iTunes store. It's in the Google Play store. It's free to download and you get a five property free trial once you do. Now, if you like what you see and you play around with the app and you're like, you know what? I could use this in my business, which you should. It's the most cost effective Driving for Dollars app in the market by far, but there's two $20 plans that are available right now. So you can get up to 100 skip traces for 20 bucks, or you can get unlimited list building for up to 20 bucks. And you and your team can use the app. You can create these lists and it'll skip trace them on the fly, or you can just create an unlimited number of properties on a list that then you can skip trace outside the app. We can help you with that or you can do it on your own. And then you can market to those properties indefinitely and you've got a tremendous asset for your business. Now we do a ton of driving for dollars. I would say a good 90% of the lists that we market are purely driving for dollars. Uh, and then we do some layering on top of that, of course, um, if we have other lists to see if our driving for dollars leads fall on these other lists. And then we also do some layering with the way that we market to them, which is why the app skip traces for you as well and gives you all kinds of information like email address, phone number, all kinds of stuff. So if you have not already, make sure you go to the iTunes store or the Google Play store, depending on whether or not you have an iPhone or, or an Android phone. Go download the Driving for Dollars app. It's free to download. You get a five property free trial. Give it a test drive. See if you like it. And if you do, we have plans starting at just 20 bucks a month. So go download it today. I learned uh, about investing. I learned about time versus money. I learned about how to retire myself through real estate investing. I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I read Darren Hardy's The Compound Effect. Um, I mean, it was just amazing. It was like full-blown self-growth. And I, sp I experienced true solitude for the first time because I felt like I had no one. Well, and you were like the up, one. You're the guy that actually took the time to improve himself as opposed yeah. to a lot of guys that don't. My, my wife's uh, cousin, he's been in and out. I don't know, four times now. And every time he comes out a bigger fuckhead than the one he went in. And uh, he doesn't take the time to actually improve himself. Smart guy. He could do a million things, but he doesn't take that time to do anything positive with it. And he just ends up back there afterwards. So that's great that you did that. It changed my life, man. Honestly, like when I read Darren Hardy's The Compound Effect, and that's probably one of my favorite books. I highly recommend it to everybody listening to this book. But it taught me the value of my time. You know what I'm saying? And what and, and nobody knows what the value of their time is until they put a dollar amount on it. So I remember I took the time test where it was like, you know, I think I'm worth $2 million. And then I found out that the average lifespan of a human is about 78 years on this planet. So, I mean, as sad as that is, if you live past 78, you know, you're one of like the top 5% that make it there. So, I mean, if I'm already 28 years old, that means I have 50 more years on this planet to produce that amount of money. So if I were to do, do the math and, and break it down on that many months, 12 months times 50 years, and then we divide that number by the amount of money that I think I'm worth, and then we divide that number again by 30 days, and then we divide that number again by 24 hours, 
at a million dollars, which is what I thought I was valued at. <laughs> That's maybe less than like, I'd say $34 a day, 34 to $50 a day. For the next 50 years, I have to make sure that I'm consistently producing $34 to $50 a day if I want to hit a million dollars. And I realized I undervalued the crap out of myself because now I appreciated my time. I bumped that number up and I, and I set it, I set it in stone at 1 billion and that amplified that number completely differently, you know? And once I understood the value of my time, I realized that every minute that I spent in this place was me literally taking money out of my invisible pockets. Cause you know, they don't, you don't get pockets when you're in jail. <laughs> my invisible, my invisible pockets. And I had a lighted on fire because I would never get that time back. So that whole time that I spent there was total solitude total peace and just me trying to find myself because I knew if I wanted the things that I always wanted in my life to come my way, I had to improve the, my value as a person. You know what I mean? If you want to manifest something in your life, you have to raise your value. And the only way that you do that is by forgiving yourself for what you did, taking 100% responsibility for all the bad things that happened in your life, all the good things and all the bad things. Because without the bad things, we wouldn't know what the good things felt like. And then push myself forward and take control of my life. So by the time I got out, I was ready. I, I spent the five grand that I had left on a on a mentorship and I joined a company just to find out I needed 625 credit score and 20,000 in reserves to invest in a real estate. <laughs> but I mean, I sat at this classroom, bro, for like a few years, man, and it was awesome. I was the only guy there that was like 22, 23 years old trying to figure this shit out. And, uh, you know, one of the mentors comes up to me finally and left her like a year and a half. They're like, Q, you've been here this entire time. You haven't bought in your first property. What's going on? And the guy said, you know, like, I, I mean, I told him, I was like, dude, I got money, but I don't got money that's clean and my credit's terrible. I'm working on this shit. And he was like, bro, you don't need money to get into real estate. And I was like, okay, what do you mean? And he told me about wholesaling. And that was the start of everything. A year and eight months later, I closed my first deal after massive persistence. I made 2,100 bucks. And then on my 25th birthday, my sister flipped my cake in my face and that was the push that I needed. Me and my sister got into an argument and she flipped my cake in my face. I <laughs> uh, yeah, I would imagine that, that was uh, maybe not a nice flip. <laughs> you know, I, I thank her for that, though, bro, because that's what I needed. I mean, it was the day before that had happened, my 25th, the day before my 25th birthday, like two days before that, I closed my first deal. That 2100 bucks, I went and I bought a suit. It had been the first time I ever actually like bought a suit that was tailored to me. Every other suit looked like an old man's suit that didn't fit me. <laughs> Uh, that suit that was tailored to me, you know what I mean? And I felt good. And then my sister, she threw the cake in my face, fucked up my suit. I was so pissed. And she told me like, you know, that I would never actually make it and that I wouldn't do this and I wouldn't do that. Of course, we were angry. I love my sister. Jen like my sister Jennifer is amazing. She was like my mother because she raised me too. My mom was a kid when she had us. So her and my older sister grew up together. She was 14 when she had my sister Jennifer. So by the time she was 28, my sister was already 14 and raising us, you know, so... I, I love my sister, man, and I thank her for doing that, for flipping that cake in my face, because that was what I needed. That same year, I went on to close 10 deals. That next year, I went on to close 50. Then the year after that, I closed 100. This year, we're already almost at like 70. I stopped, con I stopped counting because it's just insane. But, you know, um, glory be to God on everything. Everything that I've been able to accomplish up to this point has all been to God, man. But, I mean, wholesaling was probably one of the best things that I've ever learned that has ever happened to me. And, you know learning the systems and the data and all the all the things that you can do in the office the structure company structure payroll i mean there's just so many different ways that you can run a real estate business you know what i'm saying so many people preach passive income i've seen it with my own eyes that you can do a million dollars a month i know because i've done a quarter of it in wholesaling so i mean if you're talking about building a real estate tycoon with the key is going into other markets you know what i'm saying and it's literally the same thing that i was doing before I would go somewhere outside of my market and I'd find property at a discounted price and I would package it together to wholesale it in my current market to a buyer. And I would sell it at a wholesale price so I can go back and get more. And it's the same concept. So I redid it over and over and over and over again, man. So that okay. were our office. Uh, we went from 100 square feet at the beginning of, I'd say, mid last year to now 1,000 square feet to 1600 square feet and now we're going into 4,000 square feet we're just going to stop dicking around and really go all in with it but we're at 20 guys in my current office and we're all crunched together in here it's insane but we run a full-blown sales force and all we do today is just find discounted property i do a little bit of everything from buy and hold to flipping to 
uh, owner financing. I dabble in multifamily. I currently own 3% in an apartment complex in downtown San Antonio across the street from San Antonio College. And, uh, you know, it's been it's been amazing. I syndicated that deal. So uh, we specialize in San Antonio on curative title work. So for those that are listening, that don't know what that means. That is basically me finding the low hanging fruit that most average wholesalers and flippers don't want to deal with and clearing the title on it. At certain times, I'll even buy out a house cash and I'll sue for the other ownership of it. So let's say only the, a lady only owns 50% of a property, right? Well, how do I get the other 50%? I have to buy this lady out of her 50 and then sue for the rest. That's called adverse possession. That's also in a form of what's called suit to quiet title. So, I mean, we, we specialize in curative title work here in San Antonio and we've been doing it for the last, I'd say four and a half years of clearing title. I was trained by an attorney at the beginning, so I have a lot of knowledge on the legalities of real estate, especially here that govern Texas. Markets vary, so different real estate laws. It's insane. Like when you go into other markets, you'll you'll know what I'm talking about. So I mean, yeah, man. I mean, it's just been a huge expansion, huge expansion from where I was at the beginning to where I'm at now. That's pretty much the entire journey summed up in like a good 20 minutes. All right, guys, I want to take a quick second here to uh, take a break from the show and talk to you about our Deal Finders Academy or the DFA, as I often refer to it. Now, it's the original online mastermind group in this space that we call real estate investing. We started it about five and a half years ago, and we've still got a ton of our original members from five and a half years ago, which has to say something, right? But at its core, it's an amazing group of people that are from all over the country that are doing this business every single day. You get question and answer, you get advice, you can throw up a scenario and you can get 5, 10, 15, 20 people giving you advice on how to handle it just like that, almost instantaneously. It's an amazing resource to be able to have. It's a fantastic community. We've got a ton of great people. I, I've made so many great friendships from having the DFA. Uh, I, I can't even count how many, honestly. And uh, I know many other people feel the same way. So if you are interested in joining us, it's a very, very inexpensive mastermind group to be a part of. It's only $1.99 a month. There's no contract. And the best part is we don't stack people on top of each other. So that means the competitive advantages remain competitive advantages and you can use them in your exact marketplace. So we get a, a kind of a detailed you know, rundown of exactly where it is that you're going to operate. And that way we don't allow people to um, come into the group that are going to operate in that exact same area. And then that way everybody can flourish that much more. So there aren't many other groups out there that do that. We've remained very committed to keeping an exclusive group and uh, making sure that all those competitive advantages uh, benefit those people that are in the DFA. So we would love to have you as a part of it. We're trying to add some more people to those areas that um, we have space. So reach out to us today. Go to the Deal Finders Academy dot com. Uh, from there, all you got to do is book a call with Dan. Uh, he'll chat with you. We'll see if we have space and if it's a good fit. And if it is, we'd love to make you a part of our DFA mastermind group. Wow. Yeah, yeah. you you jumped right in. It's funny things have come full circle that, uh, you know, cold calling and door knocking are, are backed to some extent, right? You know, that yeah. was early 90s. It's it's interesting looking back now that, um, you know, with, with all the technology we have, you know, a lot of people are going back to the roots of marketing to uh, generate leads, but that was then on the, the real estate side. So you were simply looking for listings at that point, right? I, was on, I wasn't even looking for a buyer. I was only looking for listings. And, uh, and I just would just focus on just door knocking every day, just find listings. And there's a lot of things I learned in there. I learned how to talk to people. I learned how to, you know, look at, you know, I see property out there, you know, that are beat up, but I never seen the opportunity because I only focus on finding listings. Right. And that's the thing I see to tell people today more. And we talk more about that is whatever lens you have on, that's what you see. And the key, you got to have multiple lens so you can see multiple things because they cross our path every day. Yeah. So when did that lens um, start to change and, for you? Yeah. Good question. So what happened was I was making good money when I was like 27 years old, 28. And then I met this uh, guy named Saul. He today is my broker at the John Oscar office. And he said to me, you can be rich selling real estate, make a lot of money, have nice cars, you know what I mean? Uh, you can trade your money every day for, for nice stuff, but you just won't never have passive income. You won't ever have wealth if you don't actually learn to park your money. And I was like, whoa. And he says, if you leave Windermere and you come to my office and you just be an example of what you're already doing and just inspire agent in the, my office, I'll train you how to actually create wealth. 
and I'll hold you accountable to buy rental with your money. And my wife, Cammie, was a smart one. She's like, done. And, um, <laughs> and every time I had enough money, I would make commission checks. And uh, I used to charge this thing called a, I used to list the properties for 6% and I used to charge uh, um, uh, $9.95 for a transaction fee. This is the early uh, 2000. And that transaction fee, I would live off the transaction fee and all my commission, I'll save it up. And as soon as I had enough money, I'll buy me a rental. And so 1997, when I bought my first rental and it's been since, I've been buying rental since then. Good timing, given uh, I'm sure you accumulated a number before the big ramp up of what's called 04, 05, 06. So that was probably, uh, I, I guess there was a mini ramp up at the end of 2000, but then the real ramp up was in the big boom. So you probably got a lot of rentals at what comparatively would be some smoking deal price wise, uh, looking well, back. I bought my first rental. See, back then, my first rental I bought in 1997 at market value, it was 105000 and it wasn't even, that was just market value back then. That's mm -hmm. not what I know today, right? But uh, today, I own the house free and clear today, and it's worth like 700000 Yeah. Yeah, the first rentals I bought were market value as well. But we all kind of go through that progression of, well, I'm going to buy rentals, and this looks like a good rental. Right. But you're not looking at it from the slightly different lens, which, of course, is the investor lens. You're just looking at it from the landlord lens, That's you know, right. like, well, this could be a rental property. Sure, I'll buy it, you know. Right. It, right. it looks like it's worth 105000 Sure, I'll buy it. You know, yeah. Right. <laughs> and what's crazy, Tucker, you know this, man. So many real estate agents and so many flippers and even so many builders still see investment from the lens of a landlord versus the lens of a true investor. This is true. Yeah, it's a, it's a really valuable skill set to be able to switch lenses when you look at real estate. And not many people have that, I, I will say. Yeah. Yeah. So then did you go full bore at that point? Um, did you just gradually start accumulating rentals, continue your um, agent business, or did you transition more into the investing side quicker once you started accumulating rentals? How did that play out? Yep. So I continue to keep selling real estate. I was selling about 15, 20 homes a month during my early 20s, uh, early 19, you know, the year 2000. And uh, I was selling that and using that as my machine for cash flow coming through. And of course, I, I, my, my next evolution was I was buying uh, rental, and then I started buying fixer, and some of them I will fix up, and some of them I will keep. And then from there, I transitioned. I still was buying rental and buying fixer. I added, uh, I'm, and I met a partner of mine named Paul Labalardi, who is my partner still today in the, in the early uh, 2000. And we started building a single family home and I will find the land. He will build it and we split everything. And today I still do that today. And then, um, I also added at the single family, I started adding building apartment buildings and I still do that today. And, um, I built apartment building and I kept those or I was buying apartment building. I was buying fixed up apartment building also back then, but I was always, always selling real estate because I was making a million dollars a year just bringing out money in so I can always have money and, and W-2 to buy stuff. You know what I mean? Right. But I didn't really look at investing, Tucker, as a investor lens until probably about maybe five years ago. Okay. Really after the crash is when I really started looking at it from the lens of an investor, like how what you and I just talked about. Because before then, I was buying a lot of rental and building stuff and keeping them with a lot of cash down on them just as a cash flow. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I get it. I've gone through the same progression, so I, I totally get it. Uh, what What do you think spurred that lens change? You know, we'll call it two, five, six years ago. Um, you know, obviously you made it through the the crash, which, you know, shed a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, you know, I, I came out with two black guys, a couple of Dean lose, and that was the extent of it, which I feel fortunate about. But, um, you know, I, we actually grew our business in the midst of, you know, taking a couple punches in the, to the face too, you know? So it, it was an interesting time. So I always like talking to people that have, they started before they made it through and they're better now on the back end, as opposed to being somebody that got shed during that time and just never made it back. Right. Right. Uh, what happened for me, uh, Tucker, and I know you appreciate this. In 2008, I had a 250-unit apartment building. We just got built, um, and um, 
we uh, had a lot leased up and the bank wouldn't put it into permanent financing. Oh, yeah. Okay. Right? Because uh, East and West Bank got bought out. Uh, no, um, yeah. East and West Bank bought out this one other bank. And they didn't want to take on a $40 million uh, a loan at a time when everyone was losing their, their property. And a lot of my single family property uh, went, was going vacant because people were moving out. Yep. And since I bought things at retail back in the days, and I had my 10, 20% in it, well, when the market went down, a lot of my equity literally went away also. Yep. So I didn't have much equity in a lot of these property uh, just because I didn't buy it at a good price what I bought today, right? Right. And so when that market crashed, I was struggling, man, on uh, keeping my head above water because I had so much. I was I was having probably close to a hundred thousand a month on going out the front door on just 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 vacant land that I was paying, uh, vacancy on buildings, vacancy on retail because I bought everything at retail with my down payment, and I couldn't really sell it. I didn't have much equity in it, so I had to keep them unless I wanted to short sell them, and so. I just started cranking on selling real estate, man, for like, you know, two, three years and just and just went through that whole period of time. And uh, and after that, I realized you know, I, I'm not going to fucking buy retail again. I'm going to only start buying shit. Really, that's why you see me promote so much about burr, 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 right? The 70 percent rule. You know what I mean? Yep. And that way today, the market crashed. It don't make no difference. I bought it at 70 percent of the dollar. Yep. Yeah. You, you, you were previously buying without insulation in its, right. in, in its simplest terms, right? Now with that investor lens on anything you buy and I'm the same way, I buy insulated. Um, you know, that whole getting stuck with a lot of projects like that, especially I remember I was sitting in my office. I've told the story before, but it was August 2007 and I used to have a mortgage company and I started getting calls. My phone just started lighting up one after another. And it was uh, all the banks that we were hooked up with saying, hey, we're freezing pipelines. We can't fund these obligations. And you got fucked, too, because that bank said, guess what? All that, uh, you know, non-permanent construction financing, we're not going to convert it over to permanent financing right. on a big, massive building. That'll give you a I'm little. Gonna get construction loan on property that plans a permit for, for the land. Right. Yeah. That'll give you a little heartburn. A little heartburn. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, during those times, I had land, man. I think I lost about four or five million dollars, dude. You know what I mean? In uh, 2008. But that was the one of the biggest lessons because I realized, man, that um, I wasn't buying smart what I learned. So I learned all this from the 2008 market. You see what I mean? Oh yeah. Yeah, it was a it was a big teacher. There was there was no question. Um, you know, that, that that's no question for sure. So moving forward then, what caused you I mean, you were selling real estate to keep head above water, you know, commission, active income. Um, you know, there were a lot of people falling out of the business, so I'm sure if you were staying in and grinding hard, you were picking up a lot of the pieces that no, you know, previous agents would have got that were no longer there. But what then caused the pivot five, six years ago to really go back into the investor game full bore? So as I was coming out of, coming out of that whole thing, um, you know, the townhouse in Seattle started merging, especially modern townhouses. And during those times, I saved the apartment building. I sold it. I got 75% of my investment back, but I made no profit on the whole 250 unit building. And uh, my real estate came through the, 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 the cycle and, um, and townhouse was popping up and I had a lot of relationship on the street and everybody always wanted to invest in me, but I really didn't spend a lot of time working with investors other than the big apartment building. So what happened, I had two or three guys that had money that came to me and said, hey man, um, can I invest with you? And I used two or three of these guys to buy townhouse and I was building townhouse in and, and 2010 and 11. And all of a sudden, as I continued to sell real estate, these townhouses all started making money. That's why townhouses now became so hot in Seattle. And townhouse I, dirt. If you if you bought a bunch of that in 2010, you sitting pretty right about now. You know. You know what I told, and you know what I realized, bro. If I were to do what I knew today, I would never sell those townhouses. Yeah, that's what I'm getting at. The, the, we uh, would have cash flow like crazy today, right? We I, I brought this up before. There was probably 2013 was the line in the sand in Portland 
where zoning for townhouses was even given value, right? Yes. It wasn't it wasn't even acknowledged previous to that right. because we had a big infill boom in terms of new construction and values and townhouses and all that. Nobody gave a flying shit what the zoning was. You could have bought up so much densely zoned dirt for nothing prior to 2013. It's crazy. I, I still want to stab myself in the eye with a pencil for not buying more of it, man. This is why I'm saying, bro, when I tell people, I know you tell people, shit, when they pay me as coaching, they can fucking learn so much shit from all the shit I've gone through that can make the learning curve go like this. Wham! You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. If you and I knew that what we knew today, I would have bought those fucking L zone in Seattle, just get them planted, permit it, and just sell them off and make a lot of money, right? Yeah. And um, <laughs> oh, so yeah. I, I built out a whole bunch of them. I was selling them, making money. And I was excited in the whole mindset of just making money. Wasn't thinking about investing. I was trying to just making money. You see what I mean? And after I started making money, right, I didn't need to invest anymore. So I just got rid of all of them. I just started doing it myself. And there, again, my mentor sat down with me and said, Dak, you're making good money again. Don't forget about, right, how do you want your life to be like 10, 15 years from now, right? We talked about passive income uh, before. It's time to do it now. It's time to get back in the game, do it. And that's when I realized, oh, my God. And I'm Cammie and I, my wife, we sat down. We were like, you know what? This is the time. The property are cheap. The construction labor is cheap. We have the cheap fixer up or a cheap. We need to create a game plan to go after our passive income. And literally, man, in 2011 and 12, is really, like I said, five years ago, when I really started going after this kind of property and the bird model, that's when, for me, the birds started coming back to life for me. I knew about it back then, but you know what I mean? Really, it's about five years ago when I really started going after the burr and buying shit at 7% of ARV, minus the rehab, and that's when I started um, going full-blown on buying property only for rental today. Yeah, it's it's huge. Uh, I mean, it's, it's really, I call it the climbing the real estate ladder, right? I mean, eventually, we all want to get to the top of the ladder, which is, ownership or lending well ownership comes with better tax advantages but you essentially are creating passive income versus the active income and along the way as we're still creating a lot of active income it's nice to have those assets to offset the tax liability of the active income so it's i think that's a great message man to really know where it is that you want to land where's your destination and not just running for the sake of running you know not just hustling your ass off for the sake of hustling your ass off. it's great to make a lot of money but Where's your destination? Where do you want to land? Bro, I got friends. You probably got friends. Fuck, man. They started 20 years ago with me, and they still on the trip and running. They don't know where they're running to. <laughs> yeah, I, know, I know a lot of people that just keep on running. Just keep on running. Just keep and on running. And you know running. the trip, bro? I got friends that fix and flip 30 to 50 homes a year, Tucker, and own no rental. Yeah, that blows your fucking mind, huh? Blows my mind. I mean... Hey, but you and I both know a lot of those people. Yeah, yeah. I know I know a lot of people that do a lot more than that, and they, they've they got nothing in terms of portfolio of ownership. And I, you know, to yeah. each their own, oh. but, you know, if I'm going to run that fast on the hamster wheel, there better be something, you know, set on the other side for all right. my efforts, you know, other right. than just highly taxable income. That's it, bro. That's it. So hopefully this message tell people – if this was the 2013 and someone was telling me and you, hey, man, buy those property. You know what I mean? Plan a permit up and sell them off. You kill it in 2013, right? Today, hopefully, this message, we are telling people out there, get some passive income because 10 years from now, the real estate market is even going to be more expensive and it ain't getting any cheaper and it's going to be even harder to get fucking shit for passive income with no money down. guys think pretty good huh these guys are all very very motivating characters that's for sure and uh you know when i did the interviews with each one of them you can feel the energy that they kind of uh transmit through the computer from them to you and uh, i'm sure you guys heard that as well so hopefully you enjoyed it hopefully you guys enjoy our new format here that um we're gonna do this probably through october 
Uh, we got a lot of stuff going on this month, and uh, you know I want to make sure that you guys hear some of this great content that we had in the past. I want to splice it all together and make it um, you know resonate with you a little more, sound fresh and new, and uh, hopefully you guys are digging it. So before I leave you this week, though, as I always do, I want to give you a closing success quote. And this week's quote, I don't know who said it, but I was looking up stuff about mindset because you know this is a mindset type uh, episode, and I don't know who said it, but I think it's a good quote. So here we go, right? Win in your mind, and you will win in your reality. Basically, you got to envision winning on many levels, and uh, if you do that long enough, eventually you win in real life. Now, I don't necessarily, uh, you know, I'm not a big, like, the secret fan or anything like that, but, you know, you do have to manifest a lot of the things that you want to achieve in life, and, um, you know, positive thoughts definitely reverberate through the uh, universe, and, uh, you know, it's a good place to start. So, anyway, that's this week's uh, closing success quote. That's this week's episode. Hopefully you guys dug it, and I'll see you all on the next one.